Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our whiteboard session with RGL. My name is Leah Miller. I'm the marketing manager here at RGL. And for today's event, we're going to be exploring production shut-in and the impact on sand control during times of uncertainty. Our talk today is going to be presented by our in-house sand control expert, Dr. Maddie Mamoudi. And to give you some background, uh, we started putting together these whiteboard sessions to really continue the act of collaboration within our industry. At RGL, whiteboard sessions are where some of our best brainstorming and innovations come to life, and we wanted to carry that over to the virtual domain. So because we're eager to hear what your viewpoints are on today's subject matter, feel free to comment on the video, leave feedback, and we can ask, answer questions and, and get some feedback there. Uh, so to begin, I'd like to formally introduce Maddie. He's known as an industry expert in sand control design and evaluation testing for conventional and thermal production. He's well known in the petroleum engineering, academic and conference circles, having authored and co-authored over 62 technical publications on the subject of sand control. So Maddie, I'll let you take it over from here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hope. Uh... Uh, everywhere you are, uh, you're safe and sound uh, during this uh, health crisis. Um, so uh, with today talk, uh, I wanted to uh, discuss uh, some of the challenges that uh, we are facing in our industry and uh, start some discussion around uh, what are the key considerations that we must have uh, to address these challenges. So uh, one of the things that we see is that uh, history repeats itself. Now we're seeing it more than ever. And when you start digging into the history, you see lots of similarity from what it was and what we're facing. Um, so uh, when you see these uh, trends and these uh, history reputation and bring it back to our own industry and looking at how this trend was forming, you can see that uh, when we're looking in the past history, lots of those trends uh, start, you know, showing themselves. Uh, we're looking at the recount here in Western Canada. Uh, you can see uh, we see the more or less similar trend um, that uh, we have a kind of busy winter. In the spring, we have the breakup and uh, the number of rig uh, drastically drop. And then, you know, by the summer, it pick up again. Uh, you can see in recent year uh, after the 2014 uh, oil price crash, uh, followed by some uncertainty about uh, pipeline. And so uh, the recount never recovered to those uh, historic high. So it's quite a bit lower. Uh, you can see in 2016, there was a big drop in those as well as Nowadays, uh, anybody following the news knows that there is a drastic a drop on the rig activity here in Western Canada. So digging a bit more deep into that, we always was believed that uh, the, you know, the rock bottom for oil would be that $10, $15, but apparently our rock bottom had a basement. Uh, this time, we realized that it can get even worse. We seen something that never been seen in the history a negative oil price. So lots of people, you know, uh, refer to these as a black swan event, you know, something that nobody predicted. But when these unpredicted event and these um, unexpected, they become more frequent. One question would be that should we plan for them and expect them to repeat themselves again? Digging a bit more down, uh, you can see just in the past uh, 10 years, uh, past 15 years, we see more of these uh, up and down in uh, our industry. Uh, back in 2008, uh, our break even point was quite a bit higher. Uh, you know, and when the oil price crashed, that was a big shock. You can see uh, for both uh, West Texas uh, Intermediate Oil Price and Western Canadian Select uh, and the differential and how the differential get narrowed or, you know, widen, you know, and how uh, impactful it would become on our industry overall. So you can see 
2008, 2016, and late 2018, early 2019, and now 2020. And when you see that the frequency of them become more and the severity become, you know, uh, more significant, the question is that should we be planning for these and should we have consideration that for either short period or, you know, medium period of uh, time, we need to have mitigation plan to shot production or reduce production and what are the implication of that to the overall health of the operation and in particular with the well completion to make sure when we're bringing the well back in production we don't damage the well we minimize the impact of that shutting we don't induce a skin and uh, you know we can uh, take it off from where we left. So, you know, to just, you know, give a bit background as why this become critical at this time, you know, just bunch of, you know, uh, key highlight from the news. Uh, you know, the Canadian uh, heavy oil production cut by about 700,000 barrel per day. There's lots of, you know, economic um, estimate uh, as, you know, how severe it can get. Um, and they estimate widely range from 1 million to 2 million, but, you know, in average, they are about that 1.5 to 1.7 million uh, by June. Uh, and hopefully, as the oil price start to recover, uh, we don't need to go to that sort of drastic measure. Uh, but uh, it's one consideration to have that in certain operation, uh, production shut-in is uh, mandatory due to the economic uh, fact uh, that exists on the ground. So uh, Husky uh, cut their production by about 80,000 barrel per day. Conoco, they cut about 100,000 barrel per day. Uh, At Basca, they shut uh, their uh, hanging stone uh, oil sand project. Suncor reduced production from their Fort Hill uh, production facility. And it wasn't um, only in uh, upstream that uh, we see these sort of effect. As Sanko report that their downstream and on the refining uh, side, the demand drastically goes down. So for gasoline by 50%, for jet fuel, hugely impacted uh, by 70% reduction in demand and so on. And so you can see with all these uh, variation, uh, there's lots of other operator that they have no choice but to follow the same path and cut production or reduce production. When we uh, want to uh, shut in production, uh, there's three key steps uh, for any shut in. Uh, what are the process and procedure uh, that involve in safely shutting a well? Uh, and if it's only a well, uh, it could be a slightly different than if we're shutting the whole facility, uh, including uh, hundreds of uh, wellpers in a thermal project. So the implication could be quite a bit uh, complex. It's not uh, the well doesn't come with a magical button that we just push and it goes off and we push it come back on production. The, uh, in reality, these whole facilities are quite a bit complex. Then there's a series of consideration to have for uh, the period of time in which we shut in the well. So if we shut only one well, the implication would be simpler than if we shutting the whole operation, the entire pads and uh, multi of those pads. Uh, and the facility. So uh, those are a series of other consideration. Uh, and one thing is that what can we do, it depends on the period of time that that well gets shut to maintain pressure and reduce the impact uh, that that period of shutting could have on the overall uh, operation. Eventually, would get to the time that you know the oil price are favorable. We need to bring these well back to production, and it become what protocol we need to follow to bring them back to production. 
So this is not uh, something that just happening today to industry, uh, as I mentioned, um, it's just the history repeating itself. It's just the severity of the event could be different and the magnitude of that. But we've seen uh, these sort of you know, condition in our industry. One example was back in 2016 that uh, resulted to several operator uh, strongly considering uh, production shut in. Back in 2016, uh, Kerry uh, did a study to see what are the impact of these shut in. So uh, he put uh, three criteria. Uh, one was that uh, just studying the wells that was produced for over two years. For that criteria, there was over 1,700 wells. Uh, in the in situ oil sand uh, project that they was produced for over two years. The next two criteria was a, a bit tougher to be met, uh, was that the well be at least shot for six months, so we can see the impact of that. And then after that shutting, it been producing for six months, so we have enough background production data, we know the impact of the shutting, and then also we know what happened after we bring the well back into production? With the other two criteria, there was only 44 well that meet that criteria, almost uh, around 2.6% of the well. So it's not really a statistically representative of the overall data set. And what we see, it can be 100% extrapolated to uh, use that as uh, a guideline for a field-wide uh, shutting, but at least it gave uh, some idea. And what he was tracking uh, through the public data was that what was the total liquid rate, the water cut, and SOR as the KPI of that well before and after the shutting. I will share some of the finding uh, that Kerry had, but when we're looking at uh, these um, key performance indicator and digging a bit more deep into uh, the SACDI project. Uh, you know, the SACDI project is a process that uh, mainly rely on uh, pressure and temperature control. And we want to maintain uh, the pressure and temperature as uniformly as we could. So on the top, you can see the 40 seismic uh, on a particular project. And uh, we can see how the chamber was growing. So any uh, scheme that we create, um, of course, is a horizontal well, and it's not going to be developed uniformly along the well as a result of that. And that non-uniformity can bring quite a bit complexity in uh, the growth of the chamber, in our production uh, profile along the well, and on the overall performance and management of that well. The non-uniform production in a well bring the risk uh, of you know, a hot spot development or a, a steam breakthrough significantly higher. So uh, there's a lot of talk about the effect of shutting in building a skin, and there's uh, a whole um, background on what kind of a scheme can be developed. There was a, a talk by SP um, uh, through one of the technical talk uh, given by George King, where he uh, shared his industry experience of over 30 years uh, with the SP member and mainly talking about the impact of the shutting and the different mechanism that could damage a well uh, during these shutting uh, startup. Uh, so most of those are uh, definitely applicable uh, in uh, the thermal production, but there would be certain consideration that would be unique to thermal production. And we can, you know, take a look at uh, some of those and have a later discussion around those. When we're looking at uh, SACD uh, and in general thermal well, uh, there's several consideration that affect uh, the uh, way that the system behave. The heat loss is going to be related, of course, to the depletion. 
if it's just early stage of uh, production and injection into a reservoir, when we shut in for the same period of time, we're going to have a bigger temperature reduction in the system. While as is, uh, if it's uh, a system that already had quite a bit of injection in it, uh, when we shut in, the temperature reduction would be drastically lower. The next consideration is that if we have a lean zone or if we have active water zone, the management of that and the effect of that on the temperature would be drastically different. If we don't have that present, the temperature reduction would be minimal. But if it's present, we have a massive temperature reduction just in a short period of time. And, and of course, the age of the well, which is more or less uh, related to the depletion, uh, it's also playing a role. Uh, the other part is the age of the well. So when we look at uh, the way that these well perform uh, and the cumulative uh, liquid and oil production, if we shut in a well uh, within the first 24 or within the first 72 months, the risk is quite a bit higher because of the cumulative oil that that well can be produced uh, is significant compared to the cumulative oil that it would produce after that 70 to 96 months mark. So the amount of production that we put at risk by shutting that well would be quite a bit different depends on the age of that well. So when we finding candidate well to shut in, that becomes significant. But also consider that lots of these well that producing, they are below that 72 months uh, mark. So, you know, it's all consideration to have. And if we induce a damage uh, in the well due to that shut in in the early stage, that could drastically change the overall production over a long period of time. One of the key consideration in this thermal well uh, and the risk regarding shutting is um, regarding to uh, the scaling problem. Scaling is uh, one of the problem uh, that exists in most of these thermal production well uh, and among the most common one is silica scale. So on the bottom right picture, you can see the solubility of silica. Uh, so as the temperature goes up, the solubility of silica increase. And if we shut in the well and it's start to cool down uh, and with uh, all the uh, chemical uh, phenomena, the water separation and so on, we increase the risk uh, of silica precipitation and silica scaling in near well bore zone. Uh, the next component is pH. So silica scale is highly uh, varied by the pH variation. So as we shut in the well and uh, it gets shut in for a long period of time, we expect to see some uh, oil water separation and uh, with the time there would be some ch uh, moderate changes in pH and that could also play a role in the sort of behavior that we will see. Also, most of the SAG the operation, they are ranging, they are operating in a pH range of seven to eight and a half, uh, which, you know, is not as drastic uh, change in solubility of silica, but it all could contribute together to lead to some issues. The next uh, scale that we have very commonly in um, thermal well is calcium carbonate scale. So calcium carbonate uh, behavior is quite a bit different. So uh, the calcium carbonate scale uh, is that with uh, increase of temperature, the solubility uh, actually decrease. Uh, so we see quite a bit of this uh, problem um, in particular uh, during uh, killing the well and as well as when we want to start up and we increasing the temperature as well. 
uh, as well as uh, calcium carbonate scale is highly dependent on the pH of the water. On the bottom right, you can see a very wide slot, quarter inch slot that was get from inside completely plugged in a geothermal well. So it shows that uh, it's a significant problem if the risk of it exists and operation by operation would be different and these are some of the consideration we should have when we selecting the kill procedure, the kill fluid, as how compatible that is, and with the temperature of that versus the temperature of the well, do we impose any risk of any of these scale? So from the study that I mentioned, um, one of the uh, wells that they studied uh, by Kerry was the CNRL Jackfish project where they shut in uh, a well per for 18 months uh, when they had sand abrasion and oil spill due to that abrasion back in 2010. The adjacent well per was also shut in but for a shorter period of time of three months and then get activated. And when he was tracking the KPI of those at uh, the well that shut in for a long period of time was that there wasn't any change in SOR uh, after the developer put back to production. As well, there was no change in the oil uh, production, which is all good news. Uh, but uh, when you are uh, looking at the life of that well, you know, you need to consider that, uh, you know, there would be so many factor going to contribute and shutting a single well versus a pad would be have quite a bit different implication and we're not always going to be lucky like this case that that shutting didn't have any major impact on the overall KPI. The next example was the uh, Suncor uh, Mackay River project where three well per taken down uh, for regular repair and end up being shutting uh, for an extended period of time. And when they bring them back to production, the SOR was similar. The two well had uh, some operational inflow issues in the long run, which, you know, uh, the paper um, conclude that uh, it's not uh, obvious that those uh, changes and those inflow problem uh, was directly related to the shutting or not. But one thing that is for sure, any scheme that we uh, create during this shutting and the non-uniformity of that scheme would impact uh, how the overall long-term performance would be. In general, when we're looking at sand control and their failure mechanism, there's four major uh, failure mechanism for a screen. Uh, failure by corrosion, uh, failure by erosion, failure due to plugging and uh, a high skin buildup, and of course, mechanical integrity. During the shutting, uh, we are gonna, you know, kind of contribute to either of these. So of course we have quite a bit of water in the reservoir and due to that water separation, we could increase the risk of uh, corrosion that these uh, screen sit in water for a long period of time. When we're building a non-uniform screen and plugging some part of the screen, we increase the risk of erosion on the open segment of the screen. Plugging either as a screen or sand control plugging or near well bore plugging is one of the biggest risks of these uh, shutting period. And there's a lot of you know, factor that goes to it, the clays, uh, the scaling, um, the interaction of you know, uh, the near well bore formation and a screen uh, and uh, the fluids. Uh, over that period of time. And of course, mechanical integrity, as we are letting the well cool down and reheating it, uh, that you know, thermal cycle and thermal loading on a screen could cause some mechanical integrity issue. 
So in general, when we're looking at and try to summarize all these uh, failure mechanisms that could happen, uh, either due to sand production failure or due to plugging uh, failure, we're looking at that near wellbore uh, zone. So looking at the lack of bridging, if we start producing sand, uh, it could be due to several uh, phenomena as we have a variation in flow rate uh, and if we get hot spot steam breakthrough that is induced uh, by some plugging or a skin buildup in the uh, during the shutting that could lead to sand production uh, the other factor is pressure pulsation during each of these uh, shutting and a startup uh, period we have quite a bit of pressure fluctuation and pulsation uh, within the well that could destabilize some uh, of the sand bridges. Near wellbore plugging is uh, one of the most uh, severe uh, due to fine migration, clay swelling, uh, clay transformation, organic and inorganic scale, as well as the screen itself get plugged by fine migration, by corrosion, by a different um, scaling mechanism and of course mechanical failure uh, could lead to could be as a result of corrosion erosion thermal loading installation loading so there's different component of a shutting that could contribute to the overall uh, health of a sand control media and there's quite a bit more that we need to uh, understand and uh, the step forward would be when we considering this uh, shutting uh, for long period, should we follow different procedure than the short term uh, shutting for repair or for other uh, common work that we do in SAGD or we should have different consideration? What can we do during those uh, shutting period to reduce the risk uh, to the well so when we bring them back in production, we don't expect quite a bit of a skin. And what should be those uh, procedures that we should follow? And one of the idea that we want to follow here is that to use our lab to better understand some of those processes and better understand some of the mechanism that could lead to higher skin in these well and what can we do to mitigate them. Is it something that we need to consider in our well design going forward now that we see quite a bit of more of this fluctuation? And these are all uh, sorts of questions that we hoping with discussion with our industry partner, we can address and, uh, you know, find some uh, way forward from those. So with that, you know, I would like to thank all of you for attending and if you have any question i would be more than happy to uh try to answer and uh, if you have any comment feedback we uh, highly appreciate uh, if you share those with us awesome, awesome. thanks for thanks that, that amazing insight maddie so we do have some questions that have come through from the chat. Uh, we have a question from Charles. He wonders, is there any historical data on the amount of scale buildup that occurred in the cooled and shut in wells? Uh, so any quantitative data uh, is not existing, uh, but there's quite a bit of understanding that when we shut in a well and we bring it back in production, and the uh, sort of uh, production reduction or the change in the differential pressure is uh, indicating some skin buildup. And, uh, and we can look into uh, some of those and try to answer as what caused that, uh, but without you know, having uh, doing more uh, sampling, uh, in situ sampling and going to the depths of some of those, would be hard to address, but as an industry-wide uh, term, uh, overall in the industry, we try to avoid shutting as much as possible uh, because we know that it poses a risk to the well due to multiple of uh, different mechanism from asphalting precipitation, from um, clay buildup and clay migration, from 
uh, sand production uh, to scale and all that. So uh, it's not something that uh, we want to do. It's uh, an unwanted event that get imposed either by the economic uh, in this particular case, or we need to repair something in the well and we need to shut in. Uh, so uh, there's lots of you know understanding uh, by operator as uh, the sort of a skin that they get and what they can do to minimize it, but that risk always would be there during any shut-in period. Okay, and we have a question from Alberto. Um, he wonders if it would make sense to pump a scale inhibitor if the temperature of the well is still high because say D temperatures are over 500 Fahrenheit? Uh, so uh, different uh, scale inhibitor, they have uh, different uh, effectiveness as well as different temperature stability. One of the problem with uh, the SAGD well uh, is that a squeeze job uh, and just pumping it down uh, would be challenging uh, because we're gonna uh, inject and push that inhibitor only to the zone uh, that is more permeable and we can get it to the zone uh, that is less permeable so it's not uh, you know the effectiveness of that at best is at question and uh, the challenge is that uh, with the artificial lift uh, system that we have so depends on what kind of artificial lift system we have that could be quite a bit, you know, uh, challenging as what sort of, you know, uh, chemical treatment, uh, either in terms of, you know, solvent, acid, or uh, inhibitor we can do, uh, because maybe depends on the type of uh, artificial leaf system, uh, our option become quite a bit limited. The other thing is that uh, it's quite a bit uh, expensive and over to pull out that artificial leaf system and try to improve the performance of that chemical job. So most of people, they just, you know, use the pump down, which is not as effective and wish for the best. Okay, and we have time for one more question. Um, Colby wonders, um, is there an opportunity in this chaos at this time? Uh, always uh, there's a room to learn more uh, and of course with uh, all this uh, it's not really uh, a positive opportunity but there's opportunity to learn and understand the operation better so as these will start cooling down uh, and if we gather the data that we could uh, try to analyze that better understand the steam propagation within the reservoir uh, and the mechanism uh, of that uh, we better understand uh, the flow back from those well uh, and record the uh, temperature fall off. Uh, those all would be very good lesson to use them to better understand the process and then apply forward some of those lessons to the new operation and try to optimize the operation based on those learning. So of course there would be room uh, to learn uh, new stuff uh, and try to utilize the data that we capture as much as we could. But of course, that would be always a challenge because at this sort of time, nobody wants to spend money on uh, gathering extra data. So we are just limited to the sort of data that uh, we are already capturing and is available. So there's lots of low cost uh, uh, studies and understanding that we can gain and uh, that could be hugely valuable when we bring the well back to production. Well, that's good news, I think, for everybody. Okay, well, before we wrap up, uh, thank you, Maddie, for your insight again, and thanks to everyone for watching today. If you're interested in reading the articles and the Society of Petroleum Engineers talk that Maddie was referring to in the discussion, We'll share those links in the comments below. And if you find any of this chat interesting, feel free to share the video, reach out with us if you want to talk further about anything that was discussed. And of course, stay tuned to our social media channels to learn when our next whiteboard session will be. Again, visit rglinc.com if you need more info and thank you everyone for attending today. Yeah.
Thanks. Uh, have a good day, everyone, and stay safe and healthy.